Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Queen's Necklace. This is the new version of the game from Cool Mini or Not. Originally, this game was produced by Days of Wonder, I believe, and it was quite some time ago. I don't know if it was a full decade ago, but... It's still quite a while ago, enough that it's actually been lost to time. Most people don't talk about the game anymore, and in the face of all the other major mega hits that Days of Wonder has released, like Ticket to Ride and Memoir 44 and Small World and such, uh, no one's really talking about Queen's Necklace. So it was very surprising that Cool Mini or Not, and especially Cool Mini or Not of all companies, released a new version of the game, since it has no miniatures whatsoever. They also gave it a facelift, new artwork, and uh, some new components, and they actually took out one of the components. I believe the original version of Queen's Necklace had a necklace in the game, which is very superfluous, so probably you're not going to miss that too much. Now what this game is, thematically I think it's supposed to take place in like the story of the Three Musketeers. That's barely there. There are some musketeer cards and there's the queen in her necklace. But other than that, it's really not a thing. What this is, is a set collection card game of a sort. You are a merchant or you're people who are trying to sell to a merchant uh, gems, gems of different types, emeralds, rubies, diamonds, pieces of amber. You want to be the one to have the most of these. And if you do, the merchant is going to buy them all from you. So you want to have the most of a certain type of gem and be able to sell them and therefore get points. Now, before the merchant shows up, and the merchant is going to show up several times before the end of the game, you are going to try and... uh, Make sure you keep track of what your opponents take as far as gems. You want to try to make sure that you have the most while keeping them hidden from your opponent. Make sure your opponents don't keep track of what you have, but also make use of certain action cards in order to put yourself ahead as well. Let me go ahead and take, give you a brief look at how the game is played. Then we're going to come back. I'll let you know what I think. All right, let me run you through the Queen's Necklace. This is a competitive game for two to four players. The goal of the game is to have the most points by the end of the game. Here's the point track here. Uh, And each player has a disc there and also has a little marker in front of them, which reminds them of what color they are if you really couldn't remember. Now, the end of the game is going to occur when you've gone through most of this deck of cards. Now, more specifically than that, there are three merchant cards that are going to be shuffled into uh, each Uh, different parts of the deck. You're going to set up the deck in a very specific way at the beginning of the game with a certain number of cards on top of one of the merchants, then a certain number of cards on top of the other merchant, and then the last merchant is going to be shuffled into the last, I think it's like eight to ten cards. So every time the merchant comes out, there is a sale for gems, which is how you're going to get points during the game, is selling these precious gems. And after this, the sale will interrupt the game, and then you're going to proceed on. So after three sales have happened, after the third sale, the game immediately ends, and whoever has the most points is going to be the winner of the game. Now there is uh, some setup we can talk about here. Each player is going to get four cards from the deck before you slide in those merchants. Randomly determine someone to be the start player, although that won't matter very much Once the game actually begins, you're just going to keep going around and around and around, taking actions, sometimes being interrupted by sales. You're going to put out five random cards into the lineup here, uh, and then you're going to put these little markets adjustment uh, markers on each of them in their top spot. You'll notice that there are these little gold coins on the side here. This indicates the value of the card. At the end of every player's turn, any card that is still in the lineup is going to have its value decrease so that they are cheaper for the next player. If it ever gets down to the X on the card, then that card is immediately wiped away and a new card comes out in its place. If that new card that would come out is the merchant, boom, stop everything you're doing, have a sale. Also, for the setup, you're going to randomize these four gem tokens. These are the four types of gems that are present in the game that you're going to find on those cards that are down in the marketplace. You'll do this randomly, and those are going to stay fixed until people play cards that modify the position of the cards. Uh, these are the, their fashions, and they have modifiers next to them, plus three, plus two, plus one, plus zero. The more in fashion a certain type of gem is, the more potential points that it's going to grant you. Underneath this is rarity 
which you're not going to worry about right off the bat. You're going to keep the rarity tokens off to the side. But the rarity tokens have pretty much the same, exactly the same thing as the fashion. A, a first rarity gets plus three, then plus two, plus then plus one, then plus zero. Uh, when it comes time to determine the rarity of the gems, you will put the applicable token underneath the applicable gem, and that will determine an additional bonus that each of them is going to grant. So even if something, even if this amber in this instance has a fashion of plus four, which is plus zero, maybe it will get the rarity of one, which will still give it a plus three bonus. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is explain the turn order. Very simply, when it is your turn, starting with whoever, at the beginning of the game, with whoever has the first player marker. The first thing you're gonna do is have an opportunity to use your influence cards. Influence cards, uh, specifically, are cards with a dark blue border. You can play as many of them as you want at that time. They don't cost anything, assuming you already have them in hand. Once you use them, you'll gain some sort of special effect off of them, and then your turn will continue. The next thing you're gonna do is purchase a card. Now, every player on their turn has 10 uh, coins, or 10 pounds to spend. This is a nebulous figure. You don't, there's nothing to keep track of that. You just have 10 pounds. You determine 10 pounds worth of stuff to buy from the lineup. Now, in a lot of cases, you'll never be able to buy more than one thing, especially at the very beginning of the game. The uh, first couple of players may have a hard time doing that, but remember that things are going to get cheaper as time goes by, and sometimes some really cheap stuff comes out in the row, and you can buy more than one thing, but a lot of times you can only buy one thing. When you purchase a card, you take it from the lineup, you get rid of the uh, market uh, counter that's on it, and you put a new one out there, and you put that marker counter all the way up at the top and then once you get done per making a card purchase then you go to devaluation this is where all of the cards in the lineup are going to uh, go downwards in price except for the card that just came out because that comes out at the same time or to put it more appropriately you'll actually leave the spot empty until everything else is devalued then a new card comes out put the marker on top and that's how your turns are going to go around and around and around and around until a sale happens. Now, before we get to the thorough explanation of that, let me show you the cards or some of the cards that may come out. Now, I've already showed you the merchant, which very simply is just uh, when a sale takes place immediately. No one actually gets the merchant card. Then you have gems. Here are examples of all the different gem cards. They come in different denominations. So that's one ruby and one amber, but that's two emeralds and three diamonds on one card. They all have different denominations like that. These are accessories. You can play these as part of a sale. So the ring here says that if you win a sale with one, uh, with I'm sorry, sell one more jewel of the gem type that this card is played with. This won't make total sense until I explain the sale, but just bear that in mind. The earrings say if you win a sale, sell two more jewels of the gem type this card is played with. The favorite, this is an influence card, so you can play it at the start of your turn. It says that move the gem tile of your choice to the first fashion ranking position and shift the other gem tiles without changing their order. That's how you will change the fashion ranking. The Chamberlain lets you move one of the cost mark... Uh, Two of the cost markers one space down on the cards out in the marketplace, or one cost marker two spaces down. The Courtier is immediate card. So if this is in your lineup, you actually, when you purchase it, you put it in front of you immediately. This gives you one extra round, extra pound every round or every turn uh, to use to purchase. Then you have uh, these influence cards. Uh, these are also the, I'm sorry, I kept these separate. They're just the same things as the ones before that you can play at the beginning of the round. But these are like attack cards. You have the thief that can steal a card at random from another player's hand. And the assassin, you choose an opponent and uh, name uh, and a character card. If the opponent has one or more of those cards, they have to discard one of them. Uh, the queen card is a react an example of a reaction card. You play this when something happens. In this case, play this card to take the gem card that has been revealed in the devaluation phase. So someone has purchased a card, whether it's you or someone else, you can play this on someone else's turn. You immediately play the queen and take the new card that comes out if it's a gem. The Musketeer. Now, this this card can be played as a reaction to counter thieves, forgers, and assassins, like I just showed you. Or you can play three of them together to take the Queen's Necklace, which we'll get to in a moment. And the Alchemist. During a sale, you can transmute one of your rubies, emeralds, or diamonds into another gem of your choice, except for amber. The Banker is an example of a sale card. You'll play him during a sale. You gain one extra point for each jewel you sell in the sale. You can play the Banker with any jewel. And then the two... Uh, most like sort of uh, momentous cards in the game, the king. During a sale, any jewels of the gem type with which the king is played are rendered worthless, but beware the queen's necklace. And that is because the queen's necklace says, 
You place a Queen's Necklace token in front of you when you get this card. During a sale, this protects the gems it is placed with from the King's Effect. And in fact, if that action actually happens, the King's player must give you five victory points. So those are the potential, some of the potential cards that you may come across in the main deck and that you may buy from the marketplace. Now let me explain how a sale is going to work because it's a little bit complicated. So when the merchant is drawn, everything stops. The player whose turn it is turn is immediately stopped and they'll have to resume their turn if there is anything else left for them to do after the sale is resolved. Players are going to take all of the gems from their hand and they are going to set them up for the sale. Now you decide which gems you're going to sell, if any, you must, or actually you do not have to sell any cards at all, but if you, presumably you are going to, and you're going to set them up, let's say you want to sell more than one gem. The way that you'll do it is by actually uh, setting them up in your hand so that they are alternating like this. This is so that you can keep all the gems of a certain of a sale together in lumps together in a stack, and so that the other players don't know exactly how many different types of gems that you're going to sell. So if I decide I'm selling rubies and amber, I'm going to stack them up like this and then put them down in a pile. So I'm very clearly selling two different types of gems, but the other players don't necessarily know that until we have the big reveal. So once everyone has locked in their selection, including their sale, the special sale cards like accessories or the banker or the king. Who will be put together with the jewels that they are going to influence then every player is going to reveal all the cards that they are trying to sell off this is not a great example because i'm just doing this kind of quick on the fly but picture that there are a lot of different gems in front of you you probably will have a lot so every player is going to reveal a bunch of gems at a time and then you're going to determine who actually gets to sell what the merchant is only interested in the player who has the most of a type of gem if there's a tie then it's actually both players or more than two players potentially but um, whoever first and foremost you have to determine the rarity so you're going to add up all the different gems and that's the individual gems on the cards of each player for each different type of uh, gem that there is and that will determine the rarity so if there is uh, the the least amount of gems let's say in this case was amber that would be the most rare so it gets a bonus where if the diamonds were the most rare it would be in last place and get a zero bonus and so on and so forth then whoever has the most of each type of jewel they will get to sell that jewel so if i have the most diamonds i'll get to sell diamonds i'm going to look at what its rarity is plus its fashion bonus and i get that many victory points it is it is does not matter it is irrelevant how many diamonds i actually have in my control i'm selling them all as a lot for that many points so in this case it would be two and i would move my marker up two points whichever marker that might happen to be uh then you go to the next person they'll say i have i don't have the most rubies someone else does so they'll get to sell rubies they'll get a five bonus and they will move up five points on the track and so on and so forth once everyone has sold all of their stuff that's in their display all those cards are discarded and then you continue with the game you don't redraw or anything like that now you have to rebuild back up in time for the next sale constantly trying to get the most points possible watching what the other players take because remember majority rules you want to have the most or else you will be ineligible to sell you want to watch out for cards like the king or perhaps play the queen uh the queen's necklace or cards like the banker or the accessories in order to up the ante and try to get more points from your stuff so for instance the ring will let you sell something twice essentially and the earrings let you sell something three times and get triple the amount of points all these things are things that you need to keep in mind as you go through queen's necklace now let's get to my final thoughts well, speaking of the old version first, uh, I've never played it, so I can't say with 100% certainty that there were no rule changes. I, I really don't believe that there, that there were, uh, based on what I've heard about uh, the, the difference between the two versions. The only difference seems to be a facelift, which I have seen some of the artwork for the original version, 
This one's better. Right? Cool Mini or Not does a really good job at the presentation of their games, and this is not an exception. Um, I like the, it's kind of a, it looks like the artwork for CV almost, which I, I liked as well. So it's pretty good. It's kind of got a cartoony sort of British animation type feel to it. Uh, so it works pretty well. The graphic design is good. The quality of the cards, um, everything is just solid. So I, I do uh, appreciate that. Um, other than like the little uh, colored stone to keep track of who is who, which is kind of kind of superfluous, but okay, not a big deal. Uh, so I like the presentation of it. Um, and uh, bear in mind, this is a cool mini or not game without minis, which I guess we're going to be seeing a lot more of. But I think they do a good job, no matter if it has minis or not. Now, uh, thematically, I already mentioned the intro. Not there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're all just gem mongers um, that are supposedly in the time of the Three Musketeers. Fine. That's fine. It's not really what this game is about. This is a set collection game, and I do like those types of games. And I also like games that have clever card play going on, and in this case, it's sort of a, a form of card drafting. You have this lineup of cards that you're taking from, and it's very interesting how the system works. That's probably my favorite part about the game, is how the market works, and how cards that come out are at their highest level of value. And But that varies from card to card. Some cards are really cheap inherently, and some cards are really expensive inherently, and the only way you could possibly afford them is by some special thing happening, like with the Queen's Necklace and the Musketeers, or just waiting. Um, and sometimes things just fall off the track, which I thought was a very interesting aspect as well. Sometimes you can't afford a card, but you're like, I'd rather have this card, and I'm perfectly happy with that card dying right now so that no one else can get it as well. So I really enjoyed that. It's probably my favorite part of the game is how that market works. And it's something I haven't really seen in other games like this. So I'd like to see that in, uh, that type of thing pop up in other places too. Maybe now that Queen's Necklace has been revitalized, that will happen. Now the whole aspect with the merchant, of course, is also interesting. That's the whole crux of the game and how you set up the, a deck of gems that you're going to sell. It's not really setting up a deck. It, the the rulebook makes it feel that way, but really what it is is just selecting which gems you're trying to uh, sell and then keeping it hidden from your opponents, hoping that the thick stack of, stack of cards that you drop on the table doesn't give away too much to them. Um, and that's a fiddly aspect of the game that I wasn't too keen on, but it's okay. It, it works fairly well. And then the big reveal. Now, there are parts of this that I like. I like chasing after the different majorities of things. So in that case, it's almost like an area majority type game mixed with um, a ter uh, with a set collection type game. And the whole thing with uh, how the action cards work and how they influence everything, and also the cards, the accessories that you, and also other types of uh, the blue cards which you can throw down, the sale cards that you can throw down at the same time with these different sets and modify them are a very interesting aspect. Uh, there's a couple of things, though, that really, for me, really, really hurt my enjoyment of the game. First and foremost, it's completely random. And I understand that any kind of card game like this is going to be random, but also there were times where I felt like I was out of control in this game, where no matter what I was doing, it didn't t matter terribly much because my opponents had cards that were just going to flummox whatever I was attempting to do. Whether it was the king, which just completely canceled out a gem. And you might say, well, you can just plan to not, you know, if you're if people see that you're hoarding one type of gem, they're going to hit you with that. So you just plan on not having that. But then what do you do? Do you just not take those types of gems so then people know that you're going for other types of gems? And sometimes, like in one game that we played, someone just started off with the king and just decided to use it. And there was nothing anyone else could do because no one even suspected that that person might have the king in their opening hand. How would you know? It's just random chance unless they see you take it from the marketplace. And that kind of thing can happen. In other circumstances where you're just uh, with the accessories and uh, cards like the Alchemist, which just uh, can give someone a huge amount of power just by letting it... Uh, by letting them move something around. And that's the thing too, is that in the marketplace, a card might come out right after you've just taken a card and it's never going to get its way back to you. And you're kind of screwed out of it. Sometimes you just don't have the right allotment of cards to do anything with. And you're stuck taking Amber when you already know that someone else has the, the market cornered on Amber. And yes, you can carry cards over, but you can have entire rounds where you just don't feel like you're doing anything. So the randomness really hurts this for me personally. While I know that others really don't have a problem with that. But really, I think hand in hand with that, the biggest issue I have is that I recognize that there's strategy and depth here. 
My feeling is that, and again, this is based off of just like three plays. So if you don't think that I can make a proper judgment on this based off three plays, I totally understand that. But this is my feeling after three plays. My feeling is that card counting is the strategy here. (laughs) That memory and card counting. Absolutely keeping perfect track of what other players take at all times is the definitive strategy to win here. And maybe you can be a little bit wrong on that, but if you're a lot wrong, you just don't have a chance. So I think that this game rewards card counting and memory to a very weird degree. It, in that way, it feels less like forward thinking and strategic planning over time and more like, okay, it doesn't really matter what I did before. Now it just matters if I can keep track of the other player's cards and therefore make the best play I possibly can with the cards that I have. And then if I can't, then I just hoard the cards for the next round and do really, really well. Because again, I'm super intelligent person that can constantly keep track of cards. I'm sorry, that's probably pretty harsh, but that's how I felt about it as I was playing. Now, I don't want to make it seem like I think that Queen's Necklace is a bad game. Certainly not. In fact, there were people that I played this game with who really enjoyed it because that didn't bother them too much or they were really good at it. In other words, the randomness didn't bother them. They were good at the memory aspect. That's what intrigued them. But for me, it just didn't scratch that itch the way I wanted it to, the way that other card games of this weight scratched that itch. I like deduction, but this didn't feel like deduction. Again, it just felt like memorization and react and getting the best cards when you could possibly play them. So lots of interesting mechanisms here. I do love how the market works for the most part. Wasn't for me, but I know, and I mean, it has been proven over time because there are a significant amount of fans of the original version. I know that there are people who would enjoy this. It just wasn't quite for me. That is Queen's Necklace, specifically the Cool Mini or Not version. Check it out if you like the type of game. For me, it was a pass, sadly. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.